So yeah, um, it's week eight, and a couple quick announcements. One is that I'm leaving tomorrow uh, for a conference. Uh, I go once a year. I go to this teaching conference called SIG CSE, Special Interest Group for Computer Science Educators. It's like the yearly uh, party for teachers like me. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not really a party. It's like a bunch of talks and presentations and panels and discussions and stuff. And it, it's super fun for people like me. Uh, you get to go meet all, all the other awesome teachers at all the other schools. And um, you get to like hear what everybody's doing. Like, how are you teaching introductory programming? What language are you doing? What cool assignments and cool strategies are you doing? And we argue about things like, should we use clickers and make you vote on questions every day in lecture? Or should homework be in pairs or not? Or how do you teach recursion, or how do you explain uh, induction proofs, or all kind of cool things that I find interesting. So that's where I'll be for the rest of the week. That means I won't be here for Thursday's lecture, but thankfully our CA, Sarah, who's here today, she's going to give a Thursday lecture. What are you going to teach about, Sarah? New localization. What's localization? I never heard of that before. Well, we're going to figure out how to make um, our apps work in different countries and um, even within that with like different dialects and different countries. Um, so whenever you have an app and you want to then use it somewhere else in a different language, you need to localize, globalize and localize your app. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. Um, so she's going to teach that on Thursday. So I hope you'll show up and support her, her lecture. Um, I believe we're not going to have a video recording of that lecture just because it's hard to get that software to work on a guest presentation. Uh, but like slides in the code will be posted. And also, uh, you know, we have video of me giving that lecture a year or two ago so for people who need to watch that. Um, so I would say you should show up for that lecture and see it in person. Um, so yeah, lecture will be held as usual. Section this week will be held as usual. We'll be practicing graphics and games and so on. This Thursday, homework six is going to go out. I'm going to make you play or make you write a game. Uh, I'm going to make you write the snake game, you know, the little snake game for mobile where you move snake around and it eats food and snake gets longer and you're trying not to bash into your own tail and stuff. That's what you'll do. So that's kind of what's coming up. Uh, in terms of today, I want to do slides on games. Like where we are in the, in the um, lecture schedule is we just last Thursday had a lecture on 2D graphics. I talked to you about drawing ovals and rectangles and shapes and colors and images and that sort of stuff. And today, I want to sort of teach you how to take that material and use that stuff to build a sort of basic simple game. Um, last time we did a bouncing ball and we made some raindrops that would fall and stuff like that. So that's kind of a start. I want to talk to you about like if you actually want a little game, how do you bring all these pieces together? So I would say there isn't like a lot of new syntax or material today in the sense of like here's some new function you need to call or new library that you need to talk to. There's a little bit of that, but it's not a lot. More of it is just discussion of what issues are important and how do you address them in your code? How do you structure your code to make this stuff work well? That's kind of more of what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, so here goes my slides on making games. So the, the specific game I want to try to code with you guys, I don't know if we'll finish all of it, but I'd like to make a game that's like a lunar lander. I don't know if you've ever heard of this kind of a game before. But Lunar Lander is typically a game where you have a rocket ship, and the rocket is sort of falling toward the moon. And the moon, of course, has gravity, but not as much as the Earth. So it's kind of like gently pulling you down toward the surface. And your job is to sort of land the rocket on the surface without crashing. And you crash if you're coming in too fast, if your velocity is too fast. And you have a thruster that would fire up to kind of diminish your velocity. And so you sort of have to like accelerate with your thruster somewhat. But if you thrust too much, you'll start flying up into the sky and you'll fly away. So you kind of want to like manage your thrusting so that you land with a certain velocity. I just wanted to pick a really simple, dumb game that involves some movement and some input and stuff like that. And I wanted to focus on things like uh, how to draw sprites with, uh, with, with images on them and how to do animation and how to do collisions between different things on the screen. So those are the sorts of things I want to worry about. The slide here has some specific numbers and maybe we'll come back to them, but maybe we want to learn some things before we try to code this. Uh, if you want to play along, I've got a starter project for the Lunar Lander on the class website for today. So I think if you're going to code a game, we talked before about how sometimes if you make games, you could use some big library like Unity or something. And again, I'm not going to teach you that in this class, but if you were going to do a game from mostly from scratch, what you would probably do is make a class to represent little in-game <coughs> objects on the screen. So those are often called sprites. Maybe you've heard that term before if you play games. But a sprite is just sort of a, an entity that is of interest in a game. 
That could be your character if you're moving around Mario or Pac-Man or whatever. It could be a monster that's trying to touch you. It could even be just a little, a little uh, prize like a coin or a pellet or a, a fruit or something that you're trying to get. It could be just any object of interest. Sometimes you even think of sort of unmoving objects like walls or pits. Those could be represented as sprites depending how your game is coded. So you usually would want to write some sort of class to represent sprites. Uh, it, it, so the, the way I've structured these slides today is I'm approaching it as if we're inventing how to make a very simple game library together. And then secretly on the side, I have basically written some of this for you as a class called G-Sprite. Uh, that is part of the Stanford Android library that I introduced to you last week. And so if you use my little library, you will get a class that sort of does the stuff I'm showing you today. But, but again, like I don't like having magic libraries that you don't understand how they work. So uh, I think the reason I'm doing it this way is that then you kind of see like how I built this and kind of what this is really doing. So you won't feel like you're cheating by using this or something. Um, so what would you want to have in a sprite? You'd probably want to know like where it is on the screen. Maybe it's got an X, Y position. Um, Android's graphics typically stores everything as float numbers. Um, float in Kotlin or Java is just a real number. It's like a double. Um, I don't know if you've seen all these different types, but like float is sort of a 32-bit real number and double is a 64-bit real number. And so like float is kind of like you can have decimals, but you don't have to use quite as much space as a double would use up. So whoever designed Android libraries decided float was the best way to do graphic coordinates and stuff. So um, I've followed that in my code and in my libraries just to be consistent. But I mean, eventually everything gets drawn on the screen with integer coordinates at some point. So. Um, whatever. But anyway, you'd probably store something about the position of the sprite, the size of the sprite, uh, maybe it's moving, I don't know, maybe it has a color, I don't know, whatever kind of stuff a sprite would care about you would store in here. Right? Um, okay. So then, if you want to draw the sprite, you could write a function inside the sprite class called draw. Now, you might recall last time that uh, when you do drawing, in, in Android, you have like a class that extends view, remember? And so usually those classes have a, a, a canvas object that has functionality for drawing rectangles and filling ovals and this kind of stuff. So maybe you'd write a draw method that accepts a canvas parameter, which is like your paintbrush. And then you say, hey, draw the rectangle that's equal to my position and my size and use my paint color to draw it. So maybe now sprites are just like rectangles. So you, you don't have a lot of variety to them, but something kind of like that. You'd have a sprite know how to draw itself based on its own state, right? Okay, so that's a starting point. Um, you might say, well, I don't want boring looking rectangles. I want my sprites to be images. So maybe the sprite stores some sort of image object inside of it. The class that's used to represent images in Android uh, 2D graphics is called bitmap. We briefly saw bitmap last time. I think I drew a Ninja Turtles head as a bitmap in the sample code last time. So you could make a um, field that's a bitmap. And then instead of drawing some rectangle, you could draw that bitmap, right? OK, fine. What if the sprite moves? You could store some sort of, I think I did this with the bouncing ball. I stored like a delta x, delta y, right? But it was kind of like those variables were stored in, like let me just, just for a comparison, hang on. Let me, let me go to the, the code I wrote last time. I had a bouncing ball canvas and I had a ball that was a g oval, right? And it knew its position and its size. But then the movement of the ball was sort of external. I stored it as a delta x and a delta y. And then when I decided that I wanted to move the ball in an animation loop, I said, well, uh, ball move by dx dy. And then sometimes I bounce the ball and so on, right? But I, I hope you understand, like, that was fine for that program. It's perfectly OK to write that code that way. But I think this just doesn't scale up very well. Uh, I mean, if you had a lot of shapes moving around, it'd be hard to structure the code this way. Now, you might say, well, but we had a lot of shapes bouncing around because we had these raindrops dropping and there were a lot of them, right? But remember that the raindrops didn't have distinct velocities to them. They had different positions. I created them along the top of the screen at different x coordinates, you might recall. Uh, I had a piece of code called uh, make a raindrop, wherever that is here, and I said, uh, pick a random x and a y at the top and then make a raindrop and add it to the screen and then they all fell. But that was easy to code because they're all doing the same velocity. They're all falling straight down. 
So when it was time to like update the raindrops, to move the raindrops, I just said, uh, you know, for each shape, if it's not the ball, move it down by some constant y. You know, like this works fine as long as everybody's moving in unison. But if um, everybody's doing their own thing, which is more common in a game, you probably want the objects themselves to know their movement, right? And a G oval or a G rectangle or whatever in our library, it does not have a notion of movement velocity. So you'd probably want, where am I? Uh, you'd probably want some sort of capability for the sprite object itself to remember its own velocity, its own unique velocity. And you probably would write some sort of movement function that would tell it to update its position by that velocity. And so probably that corresponds to like a frame of animation, like every nth of a second, every 30th, every 60th of a second, update myself by this much, right? Um, this is not the only way that you could do movement and velocity. Uh, most sophisticated gaming systems or libraries, they think of velocity more like a vector, like an angle and a magnitude, you know? Um, and you could think of it that way as well. I, I mean, it's kind of two ways of representing the same concept, right? Um, bless you. I, so I just chose to store it as a delta x and a delta y. But that's kind of a simple way of thinking of it. And then if you set like dx of 5 and dy of 0, that means each time you update him, he moves over to the right by 5 pixels, right? Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that so far? The kind of how I'm, how I'm going about this, how I'm choosing to represent this? Have any of you coded a game, like an animated game like this before? For another class or something? Yeah? Did you, did you have a class like this for sprites? Like, how did you represent the actors and the objects in the game? Uh, yeah, we had, like, it was, like, something similar to this. We used Unity. Uh, it was for the artful design class. Okay. So Unity probably comes with some stuff like this yeah. to help you. So you didn't have to build this, right? I didn't have to code it from scratch. No. Right, right. So now, certainly, I'm not saying that that's bad and that you shouldn't use Unity. If you're in the situation where Unity is the right tool for your project, you should use it, right? Um, I also don't want there to be magic and mystery here. Like, the designers of Unity are either doing something like this, or they're doing something a little more physics-based with vectors or something. But like under the hood, somebody's doing this sort of work somewhere. Either you're using it or you're building it yourself, right? Um, okay, so you have movement, maybe, right? Uh, you uh, you might have acceleration. Like movement velocity implies that you're just moving in a certain direction, and you're just going to keep moving in that direction. But what if you're what if gravity is pulling you down? Or what if you're a car and you've got the gas pedal on and you're going faster, you're accelerating, right? So, I mean, look, you know, we all remember physics, right? Like, and, uh, well, I mean, I don't know if I remember very much of it, but <laughs> you have, like, uh, velocity is change of position and acceleration is change of velocity. There's something to do with derivatives here, but we are not going to do any derivatives today. I would refuse to do so. Um, but you could store acceleration as yet another pair, right, where, like, this is the change in velocity over time. And so maybe after you move by your velocity, you modify your velocity based on your acceleration, some sort of additive or multiplicative effect of that, right? That is one way, again, that you could do that. You could represent acceleration. And what those values are depends what the acceleration is, right? Like I said, if, is it your car engine? pushing you forward with a certain amount of acceleration, or is it gravity, whatever? Is it a collision with another sprite that launches you off in a certain direction? I don't know, whatever, right? It's a little tricky to get all the details right. Sometimes the signage is tricky because you're like, you're accelerating down, so that's actually positive. You know, you have to be a little careful about, about <coughs> magnitudes and signs and stuff here. But uh, anyway, acceleration, right? Not too complicated. Um, and like, I, I don't know if you're reading all the bullets here, but like, these are things if I built from scratch, I might code them that way. But in the library, I do have functions for these things. You can say set acceleration or get acceleration or acceleration x, acceleration y. You can, you can represent these things using various methods in the library that I have for you. Um, okay, fine. So acceleration. Uh, one thing that comes up is like if you say, well, I'll, I'll, my velocity is five. What does that mean? I move by five pixels or something? Fine, but like how, bless you, how often do I move by five pixels? Is that five pixels per second? Is it five pixels per frame of animation? How many frames of animation are there per second? If it's per frame, 
then the number of frames per second basically determines my velocity. If I have more frames per second, I move more increments per second. Do you know what I mean? So like some games, I, I don't want to do this with you guys today, but some games have a little more um, variability in terms of how many frames per second they draw. If you've ever had an old shitty computer, you sometimes you turn all the details down and it's still chunky and it doesn't have that many frames per second. And so like that doesn't mean your character moves slower across the screen. It typically means you sort of jump a little bit. You skip and, and you have kind of a jerky motion. But like if you have a game that could run at different number of frames per second, you might need to know how many frames per second it is. Maybe your velocity is implicitly per unit of time, per second, or per something. So maybe if you know the frames per second, you have to incorporate that somehow into your velocity. I'm not going to deal with that today, because I think once you start getting into stuff like that, like frame rates and frame skipping, and what kind of video card do you have, like that starts to feel like I want help, I want a library, I want Unity. I want somebody else to focus on that. So I'm not going to code something with frames per second stuff uh, today. But I'm just mentioning that this is a potential issue if you make a game that's like complicated, right? Oh, well. Um, OK, fine. Uh, so <laughs> how do you animate a sprite? Like when a sprite moves, it typically isn't just a fixed image moving across the screen. It's usually like Pac-Man's chomping, or Mario's moving, walking, and stuff. Um, so if your sprite is drawn as a bitmap image, you might have a sequence of images that you cycle between. And then the sequence of images makes it look like the character is walking, right? And um, that's often called the walk cycle of the sprite. And I do think it's interesting like how many different bitmaps it takes to produce a nice looking walk cycle. Uh, I don't know if all of you know all these characters, right? Uh, you know this guy, right? Who's that? Mega Man, yeah, AKA Rock Man, if you're a Japanese uh, game player. Uh, who's that dude? The dude from Castlevania, AKA Simon Belmont, yes. Uh, you all know the top one, that's Mario, of course. Uh, who's this guy, do you know him? Hmm. Hmm, who's that guy? Uh, his name is Guybrush Threepwood. He's the hero of a video game called The Secret of Monkey Island. And if you have never heard of that, then shame on you. Your unofficial homework assignment is to go try that game, which is delightful. But anyway, <laughs> different characters have these different sequences of images. And you can have a lot of images, so it looks really smooth. Or Mega Man has like three pictures. One, two, three, one. You know, it's just, it's interesting how few, like, that's not a very smooth animation, but it kind of gives them a, like, cool looking like walk, even though he doesn't have a lot of different pixels, uh, different uh, uh, pictures, different images uh, to him. So, okay, fine. Like, if you were going to build a game and code a game, like, how would you do this? Well, I think in the code a few slides ago, I had a, a, a field, an instance variable that was a bitmap. And I think what you might do instead is have some list of bitmaps. And then over time, you have some current one that you're drawing. And every so many frames, you would update the index of which one you're drawing. So for the next 10 frames, draw this bitmap. Then increment your index. And for the next 10 frames after that, draw the next bitmap. So you'd, you'd have some sort of list or collection of bitmaps to draw and some notion of which one you're currently drawing and also some notion of when to move to the next one. Um, you don't just move to the next one every frame because then your character looks like they're you know seizing up or something. They, just, they move so fast, it's just ridiculous. Um, if you look at this, he's, I don't know exactly what the rate of change is here, but this is probably like every tenth of a second he changes pictures, you know? So you have some kind of notion of like every this many frames, I'll switch what bitmap I'm drawing right now. So you would have to represent that in some way <coughs> in your code. I think on the next slide, I um, have an example. This is kind of approximate code, but like, you could store, instead of a bitmap, you could store an array list or a list of some kind of, of bitmaps. You could store a current index that you add of zero. Um, and then how many like frames per bit, how many, how many frames do you go before you change bitmaps? So you'd say on each movement, you do whatever else. You do your dx and your x and all that kind of stuff. But you also increment what frame you're on. And if you get to the number of frames per bitmap, then you move to the next uh, index. You index plus plus, basically. And then wrap it around if it gets to the the size, the length. And then uh, it's cut off a little bit here, but you, you draw 
you draw the bitmap corresponding to what index you're currently at. So you would do something like that, right? In our library, you don't have to manage this list of bitmaps yourself. There is a uh, bitmaps property that can have multiple bitmaps in it, and you can set that property to be a list of bitmaps, and you can also set the number of frames. You can, so you can like set this stuff in the gsprite library, which essentially does something equivalent to this with that, okay? All right, so walk cycles. Um, uh, I put this slide in just to kind of uh, teach you history lesson for a second. Um, older games, you know, you can imagine like if you have that walk cycle and you have all those different pictures, like each of those might be a little file, like a little GIF or ping or JPEG image file, right? So if you had a lot of different sprites and a lot of different walk cycles for them and maybe they can face different directions, it starts to become a large number of image files, right? So you might have hundreds or thousands of these image files. And um, that can actually make a game slow to load and it can have a lot of files, a lot of memory, a lot of load time to get the thing running, even for a simple dumpy two-dimensional game like this, which should feel fast. And so a trick that old game developers did was they actually packed all their images into one file or at least large numbers of them into one file, like just consecutively in the same image. And it's called an image strip. So what you do is you would load the whole giant image strip in and then you'd slice out a portion of it and you say, okay, that's this image and that's this image and that's that image and you'd sort of cut the individual frames out of there. Lots of old games did this. And uh, I wrote a Pac-Man clone once and I really wanted it to look like the real game. So I was able to extract this artifact out of real Pac-Man, which has all the images right next to each other and I used it as an image strip for, for my game. And so, of course, that meant that my game looked a lot like the real game because of that. But anyway, um, you can do that in Android, but uh, I don't think you need to do that for, <laughs> for our class or just in general. I just I thought this might interest you that like old game programmers were very crafty in terms of like cute tricks to like save some memory, save some files, save some bits, save some frames of animation because uh, a lot of times the the hardware that they were running on was like very shitty and it like had, you know, it was like a couple of megahertz processor or something or it didn't have a lot of video memory or didn't have a lot of file storage and so they had to like hack and trick and do cool things like this. So um, yeah, that's what an image strip is. Uh, okay, so well let's, um, before I go on any further, I want to play, I, I talked about how we're doing a Lunar Lander. So why don't we talk about this a little bit, how you could code some of this in, uh, in you know in like a real app. So wait, do I have a hang on a sec, let me do I have a do, 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 do. Uh, okay. I don't. So I'll stay here. So let me let me go to the Lunar Lander project and just kind of show you some of these things that we just talked about and how you might incorporate some of them into your into your real Android program. So I've got the Lunar Lander wait, this is a wrong project, sorry. Uh here. I've got Here's what I've got. I've got a Lunar Lander activity, which doesn't have very much going on. It's just a screen with most of the screen occupied by a big drawing canvas. That's where we're going to do most of the real work. And then there's like a play button and a stop button, just kind of start and stop the game. Um, so the Lunar Lander activity is not very interesting. It just has an empty kind of on create and there's a on, uh, play click when you hit the play button. It tells the, the main canvas view to start the game. When you say stop, it tells the canvas to stop the game. So the work we're going to do is really going to be in this like central canvas here, which is a subclass of view. Uh, it's called lander canvas. And so what I've done is this is a subclass of this G canvas. That's the uh, library that I've given you guys. Um, so remember that when you're using the G canvas, you write a function called init where you sort of set up your sprites and your shapes and just different things that you want to put on the screen. Once you've built them, you can add them to the screen, okay? So like if the lunar lander was going to be just a rectangle that fell toward the ground, you could do that by making a, you know, g rect object with various coordinates. Um, the way the library works is there's a class called g sprite. So I showed you those slides about sprites and movement and these different things. So I think one thing that's a little confusing for some students about this library is like, what's the difference between a G sprite and a G rectangle? I would say a sprite is like, it has that stuff on the slides from before, movement and velocity and acceleration, and it has other things. 
it sort of wraps around some sort of other object like a, a G image or a G rectangle or a G oval, which is going to be how it looks on the screen. So like if the rocket was just a moving rectangle, you could say something like val rect equals G rect. Uh, maybe its initial position is zero zero, or I guess zero F. You have to use floats here, zero F. Uh, and then the width and the height are 100 by 100 F. So maybe it's just a rectangle, and then you say rec dot fill color equals g color dot uh, red or something. And so now what you would have done before is you would have said add rec, like add that rectangle to the canvas, you know. But instead what you'll do is you'll say like val rocket equals a g sprite that wraps up that uh, rectangle. That's kind of the idea. Or if it were an image or something, you'd tell it to wrap up that or kind of whatever. And then you could say add rocket. And now this rocket is kind of what you talk to in terms of velocity, acceleration, collisions, this kind of stuff. And so you don't really talk to this rectangle very much. It will use that rectangle to draw itself, I guess. Um, so uh, if I want the rectangle to fall toward the, the ground, I could say, uh, you can't tell the rectangle to have a velocity, you know, velocity. There's no velocity stuff there. But if you say, hey, rocket sprite, set your velocity maybe in the y direction to be, you know, I don't know, 10f or something. Then if I add that to the screen, like later if I want the rocket to move by that velocity, I can say rocket.update. And update sort of makes it move itself and accelerate itself and kind of do what it needs to do based on its own state. So um, remember how we had a, a, a way of making the screen redraw itself at a given interval? Like we could say animate and we could pass in some number of FPS, frames per second. I've got a constant called frames per second, which I think is like 30 frames a second. And then you can pass a lambda of what you want it to do each time. So I don't like to write the code in here for what to do. I like to just make a function called like private fun uh, tick, which is like each frame, you know, tick away a frame. So I'll say tick. And um, maybe in here I'll say rocket.update. Then it doesn't know how to find rocket. So what do I need to do? Like why is this? Sorry, what? So you could say tick rocket, and I could make the rocket a parameter. That would be fine. I think in general, if I'm going to have a lot of different sprites and objects and stuff, I don't necessarily want to be passing like 20 parameters to here. So I'd rather have a different solution than parameter, if you don't mind. What's another way I could make it so this function can see the rocket? Just make this rocket be more of a like field that exists for the whole life of the canvas. I think that's actually fine. So maybe up here. Uh, I'll make a var uh, rocket, which is a G sprite. Um, now, so, you know, I, I've seen this with students before. Is like you guys often want to like initialize these to store some value, but I think it actually works the best if you just declare their types, and then down here in this init function, you give them their values. Because a lot of times you don't just set them equal to something, you also kind of do more stuff with them. So I think the initialization of these things should usually go down here. So if you just set its type, but you don't give it a value, then it doesn't like that, right? So um, you could set it to null, but it doesn't let you make a G sprite null. You'd have to make it a G sprite question mark. But I don't like that because then the whole program you have to write like question dot or exclamation dot. I hate that stuff. So the kind of the way to do this is you say late init, which means like it's only going to be initialized once, but it's going to be later. Um, so that's sort of the way I would do this. I'd say I have a variable, a, a private instance variable called rocket that's going to be a G sprite. And then down here, I don't say val rocket. I just say rocket equals. So now down here, it does see the rocket and I tell it to update itself. Now, in terms of like, where do I tell the rocket to draw himself? There's no code for that here. Um, so what's going on? Like, how am I going to see the rocket on screen? Do you know? Do you have a question or a different comment? Or? I, I have a question. Uh, what's the difference between what you just did and then sometimes you do like a companion object? A companion object is for like static stuff, basically. Static things are um, mostly used for constant things. And um, I wouldn't use a companion object for this rocket because the rocket will not be constant. It'll be changing. It'll be moving a lot. So things like how many frames per second, I would store that. Uh, a companion object is kind of a weird quirk of Kotlin. It's basically a hack where you can have things that are, like if you have a class and you have 10 objects of that class, 
that typically means you have 10 copies of all the things, 10 copies of all the instance variables, 10 copies of all the functions, etc. But sometimes you have a shared thing that all 10 of them want to use together and you don't want 10 copies of. So if you want to do that in Java, you make that thing into a static thing, which is shared through the whole class. In Kotlin, they make it so you create a single object called a companion object and all 10 of them can talk to that object. It's essentially the same as something being class-wide or static. So it's kind of a quirky idea, but that's that's where you, they basically that's where I'll put constants, but it's not where I'll put instance variables. It's like you can understand in C++ where you don't like, make a copy of stuff when you well, that's a slightly different concept. That's like referential, like uh, pointer semantics versus value semantics. Um, I mean, I do think there's a similar question there, which is like, if two pieces of code or two objects or two things want to both refer to something, do I want them to each have a completely independent copy of the thing, or do I want them to share a single copy of the thing? That's a concept you have to think about a lot. It depends on whether the thing mutates. It depends on whether the thing is expensive in memory. Like, there's that. That's a general computer science question. I think in this case, like these are the state of the game and I'll declare them as private fields and they're going to modify as the game's going along so my code will reflect that this companion object stuff is sort of like a shared place for state that the game looks at but it's not a place for things that are changing over time and mutating and stuff so yeah um, what about drawing this rocket none of my code says draw a rocket draw a rectangle draw anything Am I going to see the rectangle on the screen? If so, why? Or if not, what do I need to do? You know? Yeah. Sure. Is adding the rocket to the canvas not? Right. So the uh, that's right. Adding things to the canvas mm -hmm. implicitly will make the canvas draw them. Um, if you were not using a library and you were just raw creating your own view class, you have to write an on draw method, and in that method you have to draw all the sprites yourself, draw all the objects yourself. One of the small things that this library does is everything you have added to it is implicitly drawn. Like, I have written a class that, with an on draw method that draws all the sprites in it. So that's right. You don't have to say, hey, rocket, dot, draw yourself, because the library is doing that. Right. So, yeah. So if you say update, it will, I mean, you can actually jump inside. If you're, if you're ever curious, like, what are these methods doing? <laughs> Where, the code for this is all available on GitHub if you go to the link on the class website. Or you can just, like, right click and say, um, uh, what's the um, is it analyze where is it under I thought it would be in here go to the declaration you can jump inside the library and it'll show you what it's doing but it'll basically move the shape by the DX and the DY of the shape if there's any acceleration it will use you know like it you can look at my code if you really want to um, but yeah updating the shape will move it by its velocity that you have set so hey let's let's just go play Let's go run the lander. It doesn't really do much yet. The rocket ship is not supposed to be a rectangle, but uh, let's see if we see that on the screen. Oh, man. Come on. Yay, okay, I have a rectangle, right? Cool. Um, one thing is I was supposed to have play and stop buttons, and I think, so I think this code that like begins the animation, that should actually be in start game. And stop game, there, you know, I have this animate function. There's also a function called animation stop or animate stop, I forget, animation stop. So just like stop doing this. That's probably all I need to do there. Um, if you want the rocket to like accelerate, to, to start falling faster, um, maybe, actually at this point, maybe I should use my constants. I wrote 10f, I just made up some number. Uh, up here, I have a, uh, what do I have? A gravity acceleration. So let's put um, a rocket dot acceleration y equals that. And so now I think, let's, let's just leave the velocity at zero. We don't even have to set it. I think that the acceleration will start to make it have a velocity over time. Um, if I rerun this thing, so I think what you'll see is it starts out not really moving, but then it starts to zoom down faster as time goes on. Play. Whee! So you can see it starts going faster and faster, right? Okay, so that's just some of the basic building blocks of movement of things. And like again, we're using the magical library or whatever, but I just, I really don't think there's a lot of fancy schmancy stuff going on here. I'm just incrementing ints for you guys, right? Um, do you have any questions so far about kind of how this code is structured? Like the main point of class today is you are gonna have to write a game with a little snake that moves around 
And so I want you to feel like you know the building blocks of how to move a little two-dimensional thingies around on a screen if you need to, right? So do you have any questions so far? Okay, well, um, <coughs> we, we also talked about making the rocket into an image. So uh, maybe the next step would be to, instead of drawing a red rectangle, which I just use as a placeholder, maybe we should draw a bitmap. So in the project here, I have some drawable pictures. Um, I have one called rocketship1.ping. What's rocketship2? No, I don't think I want that one. I think I want rocket ship one. So if we want that to be our rocket instead of that rectangle, let's modify the code to, to, to do that, right? So um, how do we get a bitmap on the screen? Now, if you don't have all these libraries memorized, uh, we can go look back at the 2D graphics slides from last lecture. I showed you how to make bitmaps back there. So images are bitmaps. So if you have, oops, sorry, uh, my mouse is kind of wigging out. Okay, if you have a bitmap, you can use the bitmap factory and you can decode a resource to load an image. So that's not my library, that's just Android. So if I want the rocket to be an image, I can go back to this code here and maybe I'll turn off that rectangle. I'll say val uh, rocket, uh, image equals bitmap factory dot decode resource r dot drawable dot that image I showed you was rocket ship one dot ping so I write r dot drawable dot rocket ship one and then uh, when I make the rocket sprite I just pass the rocket image you pass in a shape or a bitmap or something and it'll it'll draw that thing for you you know okay so now when I run the program I hope fingers crossed I will see that picture falling instead of a red rectangle falling. Let's see. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> that's a big rocket. Uh, hmm. I was tempted to write Space Force on it today just to be topical, but I decided not to. Um, so, uh-oh, the, <laughs> the, the rocket is too big. Oh, no. So actually, this is an interesting thing that comes up is like, What's the right size to make your images? Now I could go use an image editing program and I could shrink the image to the right size so it looks great on my screen. Uh, I don't think that's the way I really want to handle that issue. Um, why do you think that's maybe not the best way to deal with this size problem? Why not just open Photoshop and shrink the image file, right? The image size should be like if it's a tablet, then a phone screen image would be yeah, it should be, as you say, it should be relative to the screen size of the device. I should probably just be scaling it until it is a certain size, you know? Um, so uh, if it's a big image and it's too big, I can always just shrink it in the code. I don't think I want to preemptively shrink it in Photoshop because then if it's too small and I have to make it bigger, it'll look blocky and pixely. So I kind of like starting with a nice big image, even if it's too big. So if I want to scale an image, uh, if you, let's see, if you want to resize an image, I think there's also slides on that. You can create a scaled bitmap that is scaled to a given size. So um, what's annoying about this is, you know, you, you pass in the width and you pass in the height. But what I think you'll often want to do is you want to scale while maintaining aspect ratio. Uh, aspect ratio is just the ratio of the width and the height. You know, like a... <laughs> This is why I always erase the board. What is this guy? Um, the, um, the aspect ratio of an image is like, you know, if it's, if it's uh, 50 by 100, then it's basically like half as wide as it is tall. So if you go, well, I only want it to be 25 pixels wide, and you say resize, uh, you know, 25, 25, like if what's drawn here is like a, a stick man or something, and you resize it to 25, 25, you'll get like half the size, but then the stick man is like really uh, wide, you know, and it looks silly or whatever it is, right? Um, you've probably seen this with somebody's like uh, profile picture on a website and their face is like smushed and you're like, oof, you know, <laughs> fix that aspect ratio. That's not a flattering uh, look for you, right? So like often what you want to do is a proportional resize where you sort of go, well, the dimension I care about is, I want the width to be 25 and 
I want the height to be sort of proportional. So you can just sit here and do some math and go, well, this is twice as much, so that should be 50, and, and then the man is the right size or whatever. Um, so, but if you were gonna create a scaled bitmap, you'd have to kind of calculate what the dimensions should be. Um, so uh, since I, I love you guys, um, what I've done is in the bitmap class, the library has a couple extension functions where you can say rocket image dot scale to width, scale to height, scale to fit. Like I've added a couple of functions, injected them into this class to make it a little easier to use. And again, like I'm just calling this with certain parameters for you. But like if I want this to be uh, like 10% of the screen width, I could say you know, this dot width, which is this canvas's width, divided by t 10 or something, you know? Um, and why is this mad? It says uh, required float found int. So how about 10F? So if I do that, it's going to take up 10% of the width of the screen, I think. Oh, actually, wait, I just, I hit run. But um, the problem with these, uh, these methods is they return the scaled image. So you have to say, like, uh, rocket image equals that you know like it doesn't modify it in place it creates a new one so you'd have to you have to modify it like that uh, so let me let me run it again um, that's an easy bug to, to make um, I think now I don't know if size over 10 width over 10 is the right amount but just like I think now the rocket should be <laughs> maybe that's too small but like okay so I can resize things and you notice it didn't make the rocket look super fat or whatever right so there you go um, Maybe the width I want is the screen width over, I don't know, six or something. Maybe not quite as, as teensy as that, right? Okay, so we're drawing images. We have velocity. We have acceleration. Oh, no, rocket, no. <laughs> Splat, right? Um, let's go a little bit farther here. Uh, oh, I also wanted to draw uh, in, my, in my sample for this game, there was like a surface of the moon that you, you would see on the, on the screen. Um, if I, if I go back to my game slides, let's see, what slide am I on? I'm on slide 11. I kind of want there to be like a surface of the moon that you're landing on, you know? So let's represent the surface of the moon as another sprite. Let's do that real quick. So kind of like how we have a sprite for the rocket, let's go back up here and let's do uh, moon surface. G sprite for the moon's surface, okay? And then for that, Let's come down here and uh, let's do our. So I, I actually have a uh, I have a moon surface um, image moon surface dot ping that looks like that just like a blobby you know gray moon surface thing. I don't remember where I stole these pictures from, but um, okay. So basically, I want to do something kind of like this, but um, instead of rocket image, it's going to be moon surface image and I'm going to decode moon surface drawable resource here and then I'm going to say moon surface image equals itself what should I scale it to like if, if I want that uh, picture like that on the screen like what should I how big should I scale it to Like I want, I want this gray thing here. I want its width to equal the width of the canvas, right? I want it to be stretched as wide as the whole screen, right? Okay, so scale to width, this dot width. Oh, I guess it's, is it an int, so to float? Fine, whatever. Um, okay, so now if I, if I add it to the screen, oh, I have to, I have to make the sprite. Moon surface equals a G sprite that contains that image, <coughs> right? And then I have to add it to the screen. But you don't just want to add it because, like, I also want to say where to add it. I think I kind of got away with, I didn't really set a position of the rocket, but that meant its position was 0, 0 at the top left corner of the screen. If I add the moon surface just by that code there, the moon surface will be up at the top of the screen. So you basically want it to be at the bottom. So you can say moon surface dot, um, you know, dot x or dot y or whatever. Um, if you say dot y, you're setting the y coordinate of the top left corner of the thing. And so you could kind of calculate the, the bottom, you know, maybe minus the 
height of the moon surface, right? You could do something like that. The library also has a thing called where you say bottom y. You could say bottom y equals this dot height. So that it understands, like make it so the bottom of the moon surface image is lined up with the bottom of the screen. So that's a pretty easy way to say that uh, to float. OK, so if I do that, then let's, let's give that a run and see if we see the moon surface there. Hey, there it is, right? So now, where we're going to go in a second is like, if the rocket sort of gets down here, I want the rocket to, I don't know, crash or something. Like I want it to either, <laughs> it just flew through the surface of the moon. I want it to either crash or like you win because you landed gently or, or whatever, right? So that's the next thing I want to talk about. So let's go back to my um, slides here. I think we were on slide 11. So once you're done drawing sprites and images and movement and velocity and stuff like that, you start to want to interact with each other. You want the sprites to kind of like collide with each other. Um, so you end up wanting to worry about collision detection. Um, just whether sprites have overlapped or touched each other on screen. Um, of course, you could imagine lots of different collision behaviors. If Pac-Man touches the fruit, he gets points. And if Mario touches the mushroom, he gets big. But if he touches the turtle guy, he gets hurt or he dies. You know, there's all kinds of what do you do when the sprites collide. Uh, that's up to you to code the logic for that. But like, at least knowing, do the sprites collide? Here's this sprite, here's that sprite. Are they touching or not? You'd like your game library to help you out. Now you might say, that's not very hard to figure out. That, why do I need help with that? Collisions are easy, right? It's just like they're both rectangles and just see if the rectangles overlap in the X or the Y dimension. Okay, that's fine. It's not that hard in theory, but there are some things about it that we should think about. Because like, I mean, I've drawn some pictures here of a blue rectangle representing one sprite and a red rectangle representing the other sprite. And there's all kinds of different, like they might collide a little or one of them might be entirely inside the other one. Just so be a little careful getting the logic right on this. Um, if the sprites are rectangular, if they either are rectangles or they are images that are of rectangular shape, this is not so hard to do. You can just make rectangle objects to represent them and then the rectangle classes in Android, there's a rect f class. And you can just ask it if two rectangles intersect with each other. So that's basically, did they collide with each other? So that's not too hard to, to do. Uh, yeah. So with the moon surface example, the uh, position of the sprite itself doesn't seem to exactly match where the surface of the moon looks on the screen. Is there a way to somehow make the collision uh, only occur when it touches the surface? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm sort of partly repeat it for the video. Like you're asking like this moon surface isn't super rectangular and the actual boundary of that image is probably something like that, you know, or the vertical boundary is probably about here. So if the rectangle's falling and it gets, or the, if the rocket's falling and it gets to here, it might seem like it, it collided, but that, that feels like it'll collide too soon or something, right? So yeah, I'll, I'll sh show that. I'm about to talk about that. But like, what do you do if the appearance of the shape doesn't totally match what you would like its collision behavior to be. So in a perfect world, maybe you would carefully look at these contours of this. And if the rocket was over here, you'd only want to collide when it got to here, not all the way up here. You wouldn't want a rectangular boundary. Or maybe if it's right here, it gets to fall all the way down this far. So you could imagine this very complex polygon that you're trying to intersect with a rocket. I mean, same thing for the rocket itself. Like the rocket is not purely a rectangle either. So right, like what do you do? Well. I would say that most of us settle for something that is imperfect but, but simple and kind of good enough. Like, I don't think most people carefully check these contours of this shape. What people do instead, uh, so, well, I, sorry, I'll, let me show you that in a second. So what you, what you typically do is you have some sort of boundary object for your sprite that's like this collision box. So like it's a rectangular region around the shape. So even if your shape was a bitmap, even if your sprite was a bitmap, you'd have some kind of rectangle that you store representing the collision area of that sprite. And then if you want to know if you collide with some other sprite, you write some kind of function that says, well, do the two rectangles overlap with each other, right? That doesn't answer your question, but simplest form, that's what you do, right? And that basically works. So it gets a little more complicated when your sprites are not super rectangular. So I think this is a good example. Like on the screen, you don't see these bounding black boxes. What you see is Pac-Man is here, 
and you see that the ghost is here. So ignore the rectangles. It doesn't seem like they're touching. But if you just use these black rectangles to determine collisions, the black rectangles do overlap, and so your game will think that you've collided and you'll die. This is super frustrating for a game player. Maybe some of you have played a game where you're moving along and there's like a bullet coming by or a turtle shell coming by, and it seems like it misses you, but your guy falls over dead, and you're like, that missed me, that didn't hit me, that's not fair, and you're like, they don't have good collision detection in that game. It's very frustrating. So typically, you give a little bit of a margin. Maybe you've also played a game where the bullet or the turtle shell flies by and it actually does kind of graze your little guy. It actually touches him, but he doesn't die. And you go, ooh, okay, they gave me a couple of <laughs> pixels of slack. Thank you, thank you, game, you know? And so what's usually happening there is that the game has some sort of collision rectangle for the sprite that might actually be intentionally smaller than the sprite size itself. This is super common. Um, so, if, I don't know how well it shows up on the slide here, but instead of this outer black rectangle being the Pac-Man collision box, maybe you intentionally tighten it up by a couple pixels so it's more like this light blue, I don't think it shows up that well, but it's like this bright, bright blue box might be the actual collision rectangle. And for this ghost, maybe also you have a little bit of a smaller blue rectangle, and those do not touch in this picture, therefore Pac-Man and the ghost wouldn't collide in that example. Now that's not perfect either because the smaller rectangle misses some of the pixels of Pac-Man and the smaller rectangle here misses some of the pixels of the ghost. But I actually think nobody cares, you know. Gamers like it when it's a really close call, but oh, I missed, whoo, you know. And you could do the opposite. Uh, if you have a good item that the person wants, like a fruit, you can make the box bigger. So it's like greedily, you touch it a little, you, you get close to it and you lap it up and you're like, yes, I want that. So you can sort of tune your collision behavior to the, what the gamer sort of wants. And like, I'm not suggesting to have a carefully contoured circular collision box or a jaggedy, jaggedy, ghosty shaped collision box because frankly, drawing these complex polygons and checking whether they intersect that's hard. It's slow. It takes a lot of time for the computer. A lot of times you want your game to go fast, fast, fast because you're doing like 60 frames a second and you have all these sprites colliding and you just kind of don't want your engine to have to deal with this stuff. It's too computationally expensive to do. You have to learn something about dot products and who wants to do that. So forget it. You, you just make these little rectangles. So I mean, I guess to answer your question, to make the little moon surface have a more fair or more good feeling collision box, Let's just arbitrarily pick that it'll be like about there-ish. You will just pull in the margins of collision a little bit on this thing, and that'll make it feel more, you know, more fair. Um, so let's let's code a collision real fast, both without this collision margin concept and then with it, and we'll see how we like the way that it looks. Okay, so um, if I go back to my code and I uh, I want to deal with collisions. So I do rocket.update. I don't have to do moon surface.update because the moon surface is not going anywhere. We are not uh, accounting for like the rotation or the orbit of the moon or something. I'm not going to deal with that. Um, if you want to know whether people are colliding, I often write a function called like do collisions or something. Uh, I could do that here, but I just kind of like to pull that out because that can often have some logic and some complexity to it. Uh, if you're doing collisions, you basically want to know if the rocket dot collides with the moon surface, right? That intuitively kind of matches what we want. So the rocket's falling, falling, falling. If its sprite overlaps with the moon surface sprite, again, the end goal here is if you're falling slowly, that's okay, and you win, and you land gracefully. And if you're falling too fast, you splat and you die. We haven't got that yet. But maybe if we collide at all, let's just make the rocket stop moving. So let's do rocket dot velocity y equals zero and rocket dot acceleration y equals zero. So just stop stop gravity from functioning if you get there, okay? Uh, if, if I make just that change and I rerun, I just want to see what that looks like. I think you'll find that it, it works, but it stops a little early maybe because we don't have a collision margin boundary thing. So here we go. Okay, it kind of works, right? So, like, how how much of a margin do I want here? Well, the um, the sprite libraries. I mean, you could. This is all just math, right? You could say, well, if it collides plus fifty pixels, you could you could do that yourself. But the the library has a uh, feature called a collision margin. So you can set 
uh, you can do moon surface dot set collision margin. You can set it on all sides, so it just pulls in by that many pixels on all sides, or you can set it on just the top, just the bottom, just the left, just the right. So I think we just need the top, you know, the top part when it collides. So like how much of it should be the margin. Maybe I would do, you know, usually relative coordinates are good. Like maybe whatever the height of the moon surface is, maybe I want like a fourth of that much or something. I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't like plan that out, but maybe moon surface dot uh, height over four F. Oh, I think it's mad because you don't have to say set collision margin top. You can just say collision margin top equals. I think that's what it wants me to do. That's fine. Now I'll rerun it again and uh, see, you know, now it, that collides with function is taking into account these collision margins. And so this call on line 75 of collides with is going to look at that before it thinks that they have collided. So I think now it'll settle in a little. Now, uh, <laughs> the other thing happening here is that the rocket has fallen a little bit behind the moon's surface, and that's simply a Z ordering issue. The sprites are layered in the order that you add them to the screen. So one way of getting around that would be to add the moon's surface first and then add the rocket ship. Another way would be that y I think all these uh, sprite objects and things, they have a like move to the top, move to the bottom uh, method. So you know maybe what I'll do is I'll just move this moon surface code up uh, to here, and I'll add the moon first. I just I want to see the rocket. Um, I want to see where it settles before it stops moving. So uh, let's run it again. Okay, here we go. That's a little better. It gives you a little bit of slack before it says that you've landed. You could tweak these things, right? You you test, you run it, you see what feels right, and you tweak it, and. Um, I think, I'm trying to remember, I'm pretty sure, this isn't in the slides, but I'm pretty sure there's a method in the library called like uh, set debug where it'll draw the collision boxes for you. Let me, let me double check this. I think it's g, is it gsprite.setdebug true? I think that's what you do. <laughs> I, I should put, I'll put this in the slide maybe later, but I think if you do that, it'll draw a little Yeah, it, it like uh, semi-transparent draws the collision uh, boxes. And then you can kind of see like, oh, bunk. So it, yeah, it's kind of cool, right? Um, it's a radioactive rocket, uh, I, I guess, right? OK. Um, so yeah, collision margin. Like again, like I think something simple is good enough here. You don't need to contour the surface of the polygon perfectly. Just sort of yank in your rectangle until it feels kind of right. And then that, that works for a lot of most common cases, I would say. Okay. Collision margin. Um, there are some bugs you can run into. I don't want to, there's a lot more you could say about sprite collisions. A pretty common issue is imagine your sprite is moving really fast. Its velocity is like such that it jumps sort of 10 pixels per repaint, per, per frame, per update, 10 pixels. And then you have an obstacle that's 5 pixels. Each of those updates might be so big that it teleports through the thing, the, the wall that it should have been stopped by. Do you see that? Like, because the shape doesn't move smoothly. Like, you, you increment its position by 10, 10, 10, and you, like, teleport through. <laughs> you, like, move through the wall. And there are, like, real games out there where, like, if you can get Sonic moving fast enough and he just, like, goes through the sprite or whatever, and sometimes you can, you can hack the game like that. But um, how do you deal with something like that? Well, I'm not going to write any code today to handle such a thing because our, our game does not encounter this problem. But one thing you can do, there's a lot of things you could do. Instead of jumping by 10, you can sort of incrementally move at each of the 10 pixels and check for collisions on each update. My library doesn't do that. You can also think of the sprite as occupying some sort of region, which is the combination of its old position and its new position. And then you can ask whether that polygon collides with stuff. You can do stuff like that. That's not a rectangular polygon, but you can create polygon objects in the library and you can check that they collide with things. So, I mean, this is a thing you can deal with, 
but it is sometimes a problem, particularly if you have like wild swings of velocity of various uh, sprites. So most good game libraries and engines handle this kind of stuff for you. You don't have to think about this kind of stuff, right? Um, Okay, so I just this is a list of some methods. I, I think this is a summary of a lot of the things leading up to now. I already called some of these in my code uh, for creating sprites and adding them to things and checking for collisions and setting positions and setting sizes and uh, velocities and so I, I think I've, I've been doing a lot of this in my Lunar Lander code already, right? Um, next would be you sometimes want your game to be flexible. You know, one of the things that Sarah's going to talk about in her Thursday lecture, she's going to talk about making your app work for different users. And that could be a user with a different device size. It could be a user in a different place. A user who speaks a different language. She's going to focus more on the like languages and countries type of stuff. But if you're playing a game, you know, some of you said to me, like, you, know, you want it to be relative to the screen size. I did a little bit of this in my code. I said this dot width divided by 6 or divided by 10. So I think in general, your game will work for more people if you write your code that way, as like percentages or fractions of the screen size. If you hard code in the size of things, it just won't look right on a bigger or smaller screen. Another trick you can do is you can draw the whole screen onto an off-screen image buffer, and then you can scale that whole buffer to be the screen size, and then that makes your game look bigger. That's useful if you want to have like a pixel art type of looking game with have nice square pixels that blow up big. Um, so I'm not going to cover that in much detail, but again, like make your coordinates be relative to the screen size. So okay, let's talk about event handling. Because our Lunar Lander game is not very interesting if the rocket just falls and splats on the ground, right? So um, normally you want some sort of user input. Now this is a place where if you're an old school programmer, you have to adjust your thinking a little bit. In the old days, you'd listen to like keyboard and mouse events. You'd say, oh, the user pressed the space bar. The user pushed the left arrow key. I'll move my sprite to the left because they pressed the left arrow key. That just isn't how it works with a mobile device. You don't have keys, right? Like you can attach a keyboard to a phone, but if your game requires the user to attach a keyboard, I'm sorry, you're not gonna make it big at the app store, right? That's not how it works. That's just not what we do. There are some games where you plug in like a, do any of you have a joystick that you plug into your phone? Like you can, you can buy stuff like that, but I think in general, most people build mobile. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I should learn not to pick anything up during class. Uh, I flail my arms too much to hold anything in them. Um, most games for mobile expect you to be able to control the game by mushing your fingers on the screen, right? You tap the screen, you drag, you swipe, you press. That's how you control in a mobile game. And so it's, it's kind of like a mouse event where you click. If you took 106A or B, sometimes you'd handle mouse events that the user clicks and it gives you an XY position of where the user clicked on. That paradigm mostly works here, but instead of being a click, it's a touch. It's a user's touch event. Um, a touch event does give you an XY position, but like you have to think about things like you don't do as much of, a, uh, if you're doing mouse events in an old school like computer game, you might have movement events. If you move the mouse pointer around, maybe you light up information where the arrow is at. But you don't really move the mouse around when you have touch events. You sort of press it, it's like a click. So anyway, if you want to handle clicks, you write a command called set on touch listener. This is not my library. This is just part of Google's um, view class or Canvas or whatever. Um, you set an on touch listener <coughs> and you pass a lambda function. The function takes two, of that, two uh, uh, parameters. One is the view object that you clicked on, which I don't think you need a reference to that because that's your Canvas, so you don't need that. But then it also gives you an event. The event object has some info like where did they click? Did they press their finger down? Did they lift their finger up? So typically, I mean, I wrote this as a template. Like often, this is what I want. Where did you click? If you pressed your finger down, let me do something there. So that's a template for what we could do <clears throat> in our lander game. Remember, the lunar lander is like you thrust your rocket to adjust your, your downward uh, velocity. Your rocket has a thruster that shoots up, it makes you go up. So I think. We could put some code like that into our program, like in the init, you'd say something like uh, set an on touch listener. So um, what do we want to do here? Well, if you press your finger down, I want to, wait, why did that, why did that underline Boolean versus unit? Oh, do I have to say true? 
Okay, I guess you have to return true. I think in my slide I forgot to write that. At the end of the function, you have to return a true. Um, but, okay, how do I represent this in the game where you press your, fi like pressing anywhere on the screen means I want to fire my rocket thrusters, right? How do I represent that? Well, the thruster is supposed to move the rocket up or something like that. I think the mistake a lot of people make who haven't done a lot of GUI programming or game programming before is they try to write some code here that says like position minus minus position plus equals five. You know, they, they start trying to like move the rocket right there. Do you know what I mean? But that's not quite how you should think of it. It's more like thrusting will make it so the rocket is now going to accelerate upward. And so then on future like frames of animation, on future ticks or updates or whatever, that's going to adjust the rocket's velocity. That's going to adjust the rocket's x and y coordinates. But you don't like do that in a loop here. You don't make the rocket move a bunch all in here. You just set up the state so that on each update that will make it move the way that you want it to do. You know what I mean? This is like event-driven GUI programming in a nutshell. So if you press your finger down, um, I think the idea here is you're accelerating up. I have a constant here called uh, thrust acceleration. It says negative 0.3 f. It's negative because up is negative on the y. So if you're accelerating that way, your velocity is going to trend in that direction. So something like if you've pressed your finger down, then I want the rocket to <coughs> have his acceleration in the y direction be that. Uh, else if the event action is motion event dot action up, then that means user let go of the, the finger on the screen. That probably means the velocity y should go back to the gravity the falling, you know what I mean? Thrust, gravity, thrust, gravity, right? So, um, and you know, I my general style tip is I don't like to have big blobs of code in these lambdas here. So sometimes what I do is I yoink all this code out and I call this like private fun handle, you know, touch event. And I paste this in here and then I say, uh, you know, handle touch event. And I need I need the event object, so um, I will pass event here, and it's it's a uh, you know event is a is an object of type motion event, and I know that from like hovering on this thing here. So uh, there, wait, does that work? What's wrong? oh uh, return return true okay, and I think this has to. Or actually, I, I think this is supposed to return like a boolean of true. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just do handle touch event true. There, I think that, that works. Okay, so kind of pull that out. I like to decomp this. You know, it's always good to have nice decomp of your little functions and stuff. So handle a touch event. Um, I've written code here that gets the event of X and Y. That would be interesting if you wanted different stuff to happen depending where you clicked. This game might be simple enough that I don't care about that. It's just if you click anywhere, you're saying thrust the rocket. So maybe I don't need those those variables, but I put them in the slide so you could you could see how to ask where the person clicked on. So okay, I'm gonna. This is the first time I actually am gonna like play the game um, where I'm actually clicking on stuff. I hit play. I'm falling. I tap. I've got my finger down. I let go. I got my finger down. Whoa, no. I let go, so like I can thrust. I can. It's kind of hard to see that it's happening because you can't see me clicking. But like, if I hold my finger, it starts to go up slowly, and if I let go, it starts to fall. And so I'm kind of like doing mouse event handling stuff here, right? Um, there's a couple things left. We have a few minutes left of class. Like, one thing would be, I would love it if I could see some visual indicator that the rocket is thrusting. Another thing would be um, when I hit the ground my velocity that I'm going dis dictates whether I have won the game or not. So I wish the game would like reflect that in some way, right? Let's handle the like, I want to see the visual indicator of the velocity or of the thrusting part. Um, so I showed you a, a few minutes ago that you could have like walk cycles of different images for animated stuff. Um, well, maybe as a simpler, bless you, a simpler version of that. Um, let's, so we have this rocket image, right? So what if I 
yoink this out and I say um, private late init var rocket image, which is a bitmap, and then this code. So I'm saving that as a field because I think I want to keep it around. Okay. Um, what if I want to show a different image if you're thrusting the rocket? So I have other images. I have one called rocket ship thrust one. I, I drew some of this art myself, I'll have you know. Uh, I've got some other ones, rocket ship thrust two, rocket ship three, rocket ship four. Pre I, I, I did this all by myself, thank you. Um, <laughs> so what if I want to make it so that when you're thrusting, it shows the thrusting picture, you know? So how about uh, I also have rocket image thrust, you know, something like that. And rocket image thrust is pretty much this code, but I say thrust, and this is thrust uh, for, or whatever, and then I scale it the same way, thrust. And so now I have these two images, one that's not thrusting, one that is thrusting, and I think the idea would be down here when you're handling the touch event, if you press down your finger and you start thrusting, I will also say rocket dot bitmap equals uh, rocket ship thrust, you know? But if you let go of your finger, I'll put it back to the one that isn't thrusting. So like, just make some visual indicator that the person is doing this or not, right? Uh, let's do it. Let go. Yeah, let go. So like, cool, I'm, uh, I'm able to thrust the rocket. Um, it would have been better, it would be better if it had like a walk cycle, right? Where it would do different little images as you're thrusting. Well, um, the way we could do that is we have, we actually have four rocket thrusting images. And so I could modify this code, I think I have time. I could modify this code to be, um, this could be an array list of bitmaps. So it's not just one, it's going to be four bitmaps. And down here when I do rocket image thrust, I could do something like, um, you know, var rocket image thrust one. I could do, uh, so I got four of them, right? So I could do one, two, three, four. Exercise for the reader how to be less redundant than this. Um, two. I could do three, 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 four, 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 four. So I got four images here. And I could say rocket image thrust, which is the array list. I could add rocket image thrust one all the way through four, right? So now I got four, I have a array list of four images that I've saved. Down here, when you say bitmap equals, you can't set a bitmap to an array list, but it has a bitmaps property, which will take a list, which it assumes to be a cycle of images that you want to draw. You can also say uh, frames per bitmap, like how many frames before you want to toggle between them. So, I mean, my, my frames per second is like what? Uh, What's my frames per second? 30? So maybe like every 10 frames I could change images. So something like uh, over three or I don't know, something, right? Um, let's, let's try. And look, like if this seems like magic cheating or whatever, I showed you the code for how to do this. You just save a list and you loop through the indexes and stuff, right? It's not that complicated. Okay. See that? You see that badass animation? It needs sound effects, but you know how to do that, right? So, like, I got, I got audio, or not audio? I made the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I've always got audio, but um, so I mean, the last thing is, uh, you hit the ground. Do you die or do you win? You know, right? Um, so down here, if the rocket collides with the moon surface, I'll stop the movement. But then the question was just like, do you win or not? Um, 
so it has something to do with what the velocity y is, right? I, I believe I have some sort of constant I've decided upon, which is like the maximum safe landing velocity. If you're going that fast or slower, you win. So maybe something like uh, da, 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 da. if the rocket's velocity y is less than or equal to the maximum safe velocity, you win. Else, uh, you lose. So, I mean, how do you tell the user that they won? I mean, it's kind of up to you. You can draw a message on the screen. You can, uh, you know, whatever, right? Like, um, I, mean, I don't know what's the fastest way to do this, but like, you could make a message is a G label, you win, and you could do add message, you know, whatever. You could also do uh, you lose. I mean, you'd want to position it some, you know, like this is not like the best uh, way to do this. You'd want a little more, I'm just running out of time, right? So like you'd put some kind of message on the screen to indicate uh, whether they landed gently enough or not. All right, here we go. Ready for this? Oh shit, whoa. Okay, gentle, easy does it, easy does it. Oh, come on. Do you know what's going on? I got black text on a black background. <laughs> uh, I, rather than sit here and belabor it, I think I'll stop there. But like, that's a little simple game. Uh, I'll let you guys go. I love section today and tomorrow, and uh, you'll have Sarah on Thursday. So thanks. See you guys then.